Hey everybody, Nick here, and today I am here for Ask the Nick number nine. Uh, this is the ongoing series where I answer viewer questions. I've got plenty more questions to film 10 and probably a couple for 11 yet, so I'm just going to kind of keep going on the list here. If you got a question, throw it in the comments below, and I'll, I'll try and post it up in the, in the, the uh, answer it, that is, in the next session. Um, but anyways, we're on number nine, and like I said last time, if you got a question, please take a look at the other Ask the Nick videos. There are a lot of duplicates that come through every so often. So, okay, uh, let's just go ahead and jump right on into it. Okay. So, uh, Madison Hively asks, has one of your EDC items ever saved a life? No, I wouldn't take it that far, although it's come, it's been very crucial on a couple of occasions. Um, a flashlight can be a huge deal. For instance, I was in the South Africa, and I'm staying at a little guest house, and this is really kind of a little bit off the grid, so to speak. Um, and so, you know, the owners of the guest house weren't even there at this point in time. So it was pretty much just me in this place, and the power goes out in my, my unit here, and I still had stuff I needed to get done. I still, you know, it was like 10 o'clock or something like that. And it was 100% complete dark in there. And I knew that I had my flashlight, it wasn't actually this guy, but still, um, in my pack, and so I went over, felt my way to the pack, got the flashlight, turned on the flashlight, found the breaker box for the unit, flipped the breakers properly, and I was back in business. Um, in, you know, five minutes, whereas had I not had a light, I might have been groping around for hours because the, the breaker box was in the back of a cabinet. Poor choice. So anyways, that was a time when it really did save my bacon. Probably the closest an EDC sort of item has come to saving a life for me. Um, I'm the kind of person who puts a fire extinguisher in the car. Probably not ever going to come up, but if it does, it's a big, big help. And uh, I insist on this if I'm traveling with somebody else. At one point in time, I made the mistake of going on a vacation with a family member in a brand new 29-foot RV. And uh, at the time, they did not have a fire extinguisher. And I thought that was kind of a stupid idea. So I insisted we stop, get a fire extinguisher. And indeed, we did. And I took some heat for it. What are we going to need that for? We're not going to like the thing. And sure enough, this person, not a brilliant man in many ways, um, during the trip, manages to light his brakes on fire coming down a large hill. If you ride your brakes over and over again and just keep it, it, it you get too much heat in the brake, and sooner or later, they're going to catch fire. It's a bad thing. It's really, really bad. And we were in kind of mountainous area. We kept trying to convince him to stop and pull over, but he was just too damn proud. This was not a great man. Not a big fan of this person. Um, and eventually, when we convinced him, when there was, you know, smoke and the sound and the smell of burning brakes in the, the vehicle, pulls over, go outside, and sure enough, the passenger side brake disc and the driver's side, for that matter, there was actual flames, like, coming up out of the brake pad area. And so run inside, get the fire extinguisher, put it out. Look, there's only a little singeing on the fiberglass, which is... Beautiful, but that really did save our bacon, and not the, the rear brake drums were just glowing cherry red. It was really sad. But anyways, so in that case, you know, maybe we could have put it out otherwise, but I do think that having a fire extinguisher there at the very least saved his RV, which wasn't a huge gain anyways, but uh, it certainly saved the trip and saved our bacon. Uh, as an aside, if you're getting a 29-foot RV, learn how to drive it first. Just, just saying, throwing that one out there. But that's probably as close as it's ever come to saving a life. Um, may it never come any closer, because I don't want lives in danger in general. But good question there, Madison. And that is why we're all carrying these things, is to be prepared for situations that could be really bad someday. So, Zachary Turgeon asks, what would your ideal EDC flashlight be? What boxes would you want to tick looking at an EDC light in terms of size, interface, modes, output, that kind of thing? So, okay, this is as close as I've found. This is a Jetbeam RRT-01 that's been modified by Vin, who's a light modder, to put in a nicer, more neutral um, light, gets better color rendering, and a little bit more brightness. Um, and this is really, really close. But if I'm, if I'm dreaming, if I'm wishing that somebody could make me the perfect light, it would probably be um, like this light. The interface that I like most is a rotary interface, where you start turning... The, the string, and it, it just makes it brighter and brighter and brighter up to its full. I think that's the best interface because you don't have to think about it. If you need light, you start twisting, and then you stop when you've got enough light. It saves battery life. It's, it's just it's a beautiful thing. I'd want a nice positive detent so that it takes a little bit of doing to get it past zero, but then past that, a nice smooth turn. This is really close. 
That said, if I was going to dream a little bit, I'd want it to be a little bit thinner. Um, this light here is using a, uh, a kind of a weird battery type, uh, which is the 18350 battery, um, which is fine, but it's a little bit on the thicker side. I would much prefer something that's thinner along the lines of a AA light uh, with the same battery life, though. <laughs> that's always the rub, isn't it? Um, so a little bit smaller would be nice. I would like a reversible clip because that's a beautiful thing because you can clip it onto the brim of your hat and then you've got yourself a headlamp. It's a nice little, little detail. Of course, I'd like it to be brighter. This guy only gets up to, I want to say, about 500 lumens and I'd like something that gets up to 1,000. Um, and of course, I want more runtime because you always want more runtime, right? But this is getting pretty close to a perfect DVC light for me. Maybe there's something better out there. If you know of something better that's rotary, that's got some nice, it's in a nice size like this, I'd love to hear about it. But I think that's really what I'm after, is a small light with great runtime, great brightness, a great rotary control, and maybe a reversible clip. And ideally, that isn't black, because I rant every time about black flashlights. Put some freaking tritium in it or something, make it glow. You're using it in the dark. Come on, people. But there you go. Great question there, Zach. Moving on. So Jim Ramsey Corey asks, uh, can you recommend a good sheep's foot blade? It doesn't have to be too budgety. Uh, a budget sheep's foot, by the way, would be a cheap's foot. Uh, okay, I try. Anyways, um, I'm only going to speak to knives that I've handled personally. There are lots of other sheep's foot knives out there in the world, but a couple come to mind. Um, this guy right here is the Spyderco Rodi, and it shows that conventional sheep's foot sort of approach, although it's a very small blade. It's got sort of a blunted tip to it, and then a largely flat blade with a little bit of... And this is a nice little choice. I'm not making a full recommendation because I haven't finished my full review, but so far I've been impressed with this little guy. Um, and it is a cheap's foot. It's about 50 bucks. So that's nice. My favorite cheap's foot blades out there in the world are going to be the uh, Insingo line uh, from Chris Reeve Knives. He offers the Insingo blade as an option. And the Insingo is just, it's stellar, honestly. Um, I really love that blade shape. And so I really wish I loved the Sebenza line that it comes on. Every time I see it in Singo, it's just like, I want that blade, but then I handle the knife and it's just, it's dead to me. So, but really do consider the in Singo blades off of Chris Reeve knives. Benchmade also makes a sheep's foot griptilian uh, with the uh, opener hole, the spidey opener hole. And so that's going to be my favorite kind of griptilian, 100%. The 20 CV uh, sheep's foot griptilian is going to be really hard to beat uh, these days. That's a nice thing. Also, the Benchmade Triage is another good option. It's meant as kind of a first responder rescue knife. Uh, it's got a seatbelt hook and everything like that, but it's a pretty damn good knife. Um, and, you know, of course, it's a Benchmade, so you got to handle it first. Same thing with the grip. Make sure everything's scented and whatnot. Um, but nonetheless, that's something you might consider if you're after a sheep's foot. Uh, Spydeco also does make the Pingo knife. Uh, which I'm not a big fan of personally. It's got very thick blade stock. It's a slip joint without any kind of a choil or anything like that. I'm, I'm not a huge fan. You can watch my I did a why I sold my review, but it is a good sheep's foot blade, so something to consider. The Spyderco Rock Lobster has been discontinued, but it's one of the nicer sheep's foot options out there. And then finally, the ZT0770CF is another good choice there. I've got a review of that guy on the channel, and although it didn't quite make gem because it's assisted, it's a very nice knife. And so that's another good sheep's foot option. Great uh, great question there, Jim. Okay, so uh, Cloud Cleaver 23 asks, what do you think about finger choils? Well, I think I like them by and large. Finger choils are place on the blade you know, your finger is designed to rest. On some knives, it can be functional, like on the Spyderco slip joint here, uh, as the roadie, you can use the finger choil to keep it from basically shutting onto your hand. That's a beautiful thing. Some knives, it's just a part of the experience, is the Aegis Hoplite. I got a review coming up of this guy. But the finger choil here is just designed to let you have a little bit more control and a different grip. Um, you know, that's nice. Hinderer's XM18 lineup has finger choils, which I like. Spyderco does a lot of them too. And in some cases, I'll even add them to a knife. This is the uh, Kaiser Velox 2. Doesn't come with a finger choil, but I ground one in afterwards because I felt like it was a better approach. And because, well, it had some other issues separately, but, um, and so I do tend to like a finger choil. Um, that said, at the end of the day, there are knives I have and love that don't really have one. You can rest your finger here on the Norseman, but you don't need to. Uh, same thing with the Hati. Uh, it's not really designed with a choil. 
Um, so if I can get one, I'd like it. But otherwise, it's not a super necessity to me. Good question, though. Okay, so Cloud Cleave also asks, what do you think of the trend of carrying a small utility knife, uh, like a Rexford RUT, Garber EAB, whatever, to handle abusive tasks and loaner work while you spare your real blade? Well, I definitely am a fan of a utility knife for a situation where you know you're going to hurt your knife. Uh, something like if you're cutting cardboard on a, on a concrete floor, then this is the best thing to do if you're cutting carpet, whatever. Because, and I tend to prefer the ones where you just break off the end of the knife because you snap this off, you got a fresh tip and a fresh blade. But anyways, um, you know, there's no sense in putting a bunch of wear on a knife that you know you're going to be trying to carry for the next few years. Um, you know, I think there's, it's fine, but at the end of the day, I like my knives and I want to keep them in decent condition. And really abusive tasks, I'd much rather do that to a disposable blade. And so for those situations, carrying like an RUT, a uh, Neaplete, whatever, just any of the little utility blade holders, beautiful thing. The other thing you mentioned is loners, and that's always kind of an awkward situation. Let's say you're carrying your Greensmo Norseman, or you're carrying something else that you really do love. Um, and somebody says, hey, hey, Nick, can I borrow your knife? It's always an awkward question, because you just don't know what they got planned. Are they trying to cut through a nail? Are they trying to cut through wire? Are they just, you know, what are they doing here? Are they just opening a box? And so really often I'll say, oh, well, this knife's in. It works better if you got the Norseman. This knife's a little bit weird. Here, I'll take care of it. What, what's going on? Or, you know, if somebody is repeatedly asking to borrow your knife, that's a really good opportunity for you as a friend to say, hey, Look, I picked you up something. Get them something that's small. Get them something that's durable, like your Rat One, if they think they are the uh, Iablete here. And that way, you know, it's a way for you to grow closer to somebody as a friend. Like, hey, I see you got a need regularly, so I got your back here. And you're looking at like 20 bucks. And it's also a way to keep your knife safe. And you might get them into the hobby, too. Why not? Um, and in other situations, I'll just ask, yeah, sure, what you cutting? And that'll give me the opportunity, oh, you know, I think for wire, we're better off going to find some tin snips or something like that. There's not a really great way to handle it socially, but, you know, if you're carrying expensive knives that you want to keep in really good shape, uh, sometimes you got to be a little bit awkward about it. That is one of the advantages to carrying something that is just an absolute beater, especially if you're in a situation that needs beaten. Um, you know, if you've got yourself a knife that can take any abuse they throw at it and just sharpen back up, then you don't have to worry about it. But people are very, very good at destroying borrowed knives. So, something to keep in mind. If you've got a really good solution for, hey, can I borrow your knife? Leave it in the comments. I'm sure you guys have heard about this and thought about this. Let me know what you're thinking. Great question there, Cloud Cleaver. And I'm, I want to do a couple of reviews of some more of those utility blade holders, because they are interesting. I've done the Iablete, um, and I'll, I'll find some other ones. I think it could be cool. All right, moving on. So, Get Wrecked asks, any small EDC knives you'd recommend? Well, I mean, first off, sadly, this is an area that's been really ignored in the last few years by the knife-making world. Everything they tend to be coming out with that's interesting tends to be huge. Knives under three inches that are really excellently made are unfortunately a little bit on the rare side. I hope that people stop making more small knives. But that's a separate rant for a separate day, and there's also a lot out there I haven't tried. And so don't be offended if your favorite isn't on this list. Feel free to leave it in the comments. Um, but I'm considering small to be something that is actually under three inches. Um, so there are a lot of good things in the traditional world. Things like your Open L, your Victorinox Classics, um, your slip joint knives, and even some of your modern slip joints, like the Spyderco Urban, the UK PK, uh, the Pingo, things like that, can all be... Actually, the UK PK is a little over three, but still. Those can all be pretty good choices in the small side. But there are modern knives that are very, very good in terms of being small sorts of things. This is the Spyderco Dragonfly, and this is one of my absolute favorite small knives. If somebody says, Nick, you're gonna need a really small knife where you're going, this is what I usually reach for. There's a lot, a lot of good here. Um, absolutely stellar little knife. Um, also, the Spyderco Chaparral is a pretty decent choice. I have a review. I called it a gem. Um, the, the lock bar is a little on the sharp side, but that's really the worst thing I can say about it. Um, the Kershaw Cryo is another good knife that is on the smaller side, although it's not small, small. Uh, but it's still a pretty good uh, knife, very much so, as is the Cold Steel Tough Light. Um, you know, it's a very different sort of thing, and it's very big in the pocket, but it is a small blade, legally speaking, so that's nice. 
There's also the Chris Reeve Knives Mandi, which is pretty expensive, but absolutely beautiful and a great small knife. The Chris Reeve Knives in Kosi is a knife that I didn't like ergonomically. It didn't fit my hand very well at all, but some people love it, and it is a great small knife, and so that's something to keep in mind. And uh, yeah, I mean, there are lots of other smaller options out there, but I haven't gotten the chance to try all of them. That's an area I'd really love to spend more time in as a reviewer. There are way too many 3.75 inch monstrosities out in the world. I'd love to see some great stuff on the three start coming out more. Knife makers, please, please get on it. Anyways, great question there, get wrecked, and uh, no thank you, I'd rather not get wrecked. Sorry, it's just how I roll. So Arthur Leyenberger asks, who makes the black and blue scale you see in videos? Where'd you get it? What's the weight capacity? Who makes it? Honestly, I got no idea. It's an MS-600, that's for sure. Um, and it, uh, but this actually came in a lab kit for a class that my fiance took. They included a little tiny scale here. And uh, so after the, she was finished the course, I just kept the scale around figuring, okay, you know, why not? And then realized at one point when I was doing these reviews, oh, I, I have a little scale. I don't think it's the most accurate thing on earth. I certainly wouldn't be using it for actually weighing things for commerce or something. But, um, you know, it does fine for this. It gives me roughly the weight, <laughs> 5.4 ounces. Um, but that's, that's kind of the story here. As for the weight capacity, I don't know. Let's find out. 13, 14, uh, looks like about 22, 23 ounces. Okay, go figure, right? Um, so there you go. That's the story behind the little black and blue scale you see in the videos. Hope that was interesting. So uh, Vice Commando asks, what do you think of the hipster watches that are a chore to read but have interesting mechanics? Like all your watches from your Tokyo Flash or the blade turbines or your blackout watches where the hands are black and the face is black. Um, to me, a watch has exactly one job, and that is to tell me the time quickly and accurately. If a watch cannot do that, either because it's not accurate or because it's really, really hard to read, uh, for me, that's not a wristwatch. That's a bracelet. There's absolutely nothing wrong with wearing a good, fashionable bracelet. And if it happens to tell you the time sometimes, then okay, cool, have fun. But at the end of the day, for something to even qualify as a watch in my brain, it needs to be readable. And it needs to be, uh, you can't have to, you know, press the button, watch the turbine spin up with the LEDs that display the time in binary. That's, that's cool. And I bet that's really fashionable, but it's not what I'm after, functionally speaking, as a wristwatch. And so those things, although interesting, are not really interesting to me as a reviewer and certainly not to me for my EDC. Great question, though, and there are a lot of those out there. Oh, my God. The number of non-readable watches is astounding. I think I must be the only person out there who wants to read a wristwatch. But, hey, go figure. Good question there, Vice Commando. So Arthur Leyenberger says, Chris Reeve Knives is one of the best production knife producers. Yeah, I agree with you there, Arthur. Especially with their lifetime warranty. We'll fix it, tune it, as long as you didn't screw it up too bad. He asks, what percentage of their high prices do you think is their built-in margin to cover this warranty? Well, honestly, I don't know. I'm not their accountant. I, I couldn't tell you exactly. But what I will say is that um, in terms of the value, that is the amount of knife you're getting for the amount of money, Chris Reeve doesn't strike me as so bad. Yeah, some of their products are a little higher than I'd like to see. The Encosi, particularly, and even the Sabenza lineup could stand to drop down a little bit here. But things like the Umnums on, the Tylock, etc., don't seem that overpriced to me. Sure, there's maybe a little bit of padding in there. I'd be a little happier paying a little bit less. But at the same time, it's not a company where I feel like the prices are out of line. And so the fact that the prices that aren't insane to start with include this great warranty seems pretty okay to me. I wish I knew what the number was. That'd be interesting. But I think the only sure way to ask this is to go up to the Chris Reeve table at a show and ask. They probably aren't going to tell you. So sorry, wish I could give you a better answer there, Arthur. So Arthur Leyenberger says, can you comment on Chris Reeve Knives' current packaging? He says, I don't care for it. Even other cheaper brands have nicer packaging, and even Chris Reeve's pre uh, previous rectangular box was more classy. Uh, of course, he says, one's buying the knife, not the box. What do you think? Uh, good question. So this is the previous generation Chris Reeve Knives box, which he's talking about there, which is just fine. There's a lot of good here. Um, there's also, though, the, the new one, and you can see that in the uh, in Singo Sabenza video that I did, why I sold mine. It shows up at the very end. It's fine. Um, but the thing is, that's kind of how I feel about boxes for knives in general. They're, they're fine. 
Uh, there's not a whole lot of need to the box. It just needs to get the knife from the factory to my doorstep in decent condition. Um, and so I would much rather they use a fairly inexpensive box that I can, you know, get rid of later, um, rather than something big and fancy. That said, there is a certain pleasure to the, the high-end stuff. If you're buying a custom knife, you can do a little bit better. I've seen people do a pelican case with a cutout insert for things. I, you know, those, those little things are very nice. I'm a big fan of that. Um, I'm also a big fan of fabric pouches, like Spyderco sent the Nirvana out in a pouch rather than a box, and that's great, because you can use that pouch again later on. It's a nice little thing, rather than just another damn box that's going to sit in the drawer and rot. So, um, I'm a big fan of either just use a cheap box that gets out of my way once the knife is due me, or make it something a little bit more meaningful and substantial. Send a fabric pouch with a spot for the tools or a, a pelican case. But at the end of the day, if it's a choice between spending 70 bucks on packaging or selling the knife for 70 bucks less, I'd rather have the cheaper knife because I'm never going to be carrying the packaging, by and large. So, good question there, Arthur. So, uh, Sao Davi asks, I'm interested in some of the custom knives you review, but since customs are handmade, I'm concerned about quality consistency between products. For instance, he says, if I buy a Greensmall Norseman or a Neon, will it be just like the ones you evaluate, where there'll be differences from one to the next? Well, yeah. That's always a factor, whether you're looking at a production knife, a mid-tech, whatever. I always talk about knives as if they're perfect examples of the rest of them, and that's honestly not a good thing. Scientifically speaking, it should be the case that there are some knives that are perfect, there are some knives that are terrible, and there are, most of them are going to fall someplace in the middle there. Um, one of the joys of a custom knife, though, is that each one is handled and quality controlled by the custom maker. So John Greensmo and Eric Greensmo, one of the reasons I like them so damn much is that they are really obsessive about quality control. And so a knife will not leave their shop if it's not to a certain standard. They talk about that in one of their Q&A videos, their QC process. I actually asked the question. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind there. Um, the other thing is that with a lot of the more modern computer-controlled knives, computer cut, they are less unique. The Shirogorov Neons, by and large, should be pretty similar. Sometimes things get a little bit out of whack or something like that. You might get one with worse tolerances. But the, one of the joys of making a knife almost entirely by computer is that they should be relatively similar to one another. Well, you got to watch out are what are called the mid-tech knives, where small batch production, a, a manufacturer, I'm sorry, a knife maker might order a batch of, you know, 60 handles or something like that and assemble them in a shop and grind out the, the blades by hand. Those situations are often, uh, maybe the maker isn't as directly involved, so the quality control check isn't there, and you can get more variability. And unfortunately, there are knives like the Southern Tolk that have a great big distribution. You get some of the great detent, some of the bad detent, and some in the middle. Um, and so a good way to gauge this, if you're really concerned, is to look on the forums. Look at how many people are saying something like, I got a Greensmo Norseman and it's a lemon. Um, that really doesn't come up. There may be one, you know, grumpy guy out there. There's always one grumpy guy out there. But see how many people talk about and do your research. See how many people who got a Shirogorov Neon say, you know, oh, mine had a terrible action. Something like that. Again, I've not heard much of that. But you can hear that about some other brands and some other companies. So I think that's really the best way to check the consistency is to look online and also to buy from makers you trust. I know that the Greensmos are going to put out decent product. My impression is that, by and large, the Shirogora brothers are going to put out a decent product. And there's some other manufacturers that I trust to do the quality control job right, just like there are some manufacturers I know just aren't going to be consistent at all. And so those folks I tend to back away from. So uh, Brian Taylor asks, Nick, you mentioned you went to graduate school at one point. What's your academic background, and what do you do for a living? Maybe a little more specific than Office Drone? Okay, sure. Actually, it turns out I've, I've had a lot of schooling. Um, I finished the high school, then I went on, I got a bachelor's degree, and at that point I really fell in love with the acoustics, um, with the fact that we can pull out of the air sound and turn it into something that's informative about the world, whether it's, huh, that's a duck quacking, or, huh, that guy's saying something, or, you know, any other kind of thing. We can turn these fiddly little waves in the air into useful information. And that's really cool. And that got me interested in signal processing and how we do that as humans. And uh, now, then I went ahead and because I was still obsessed, I got a master's degree. And because I was obsessed and crazy, 
I spent a bunch of time, a bunch of effort, a long, long process, but I eventually ended up getting a PhD. And so, uh, technically, I am Dr. Nick, uh, which is pretty excellent because of the Simpsons reference. Hi, everybody. But um, nonetheless, yeah, Dr. Nick Shabazz. Don't advertise myself that way very often because I'm pretentious enough as it is. And I don't want my viewers sending me pictures of moles thinking I'm the other kind of doctor. But it's true. Um, in terms of what I do for a living, I'm not going to go into too much detail because it's a small world and you never know when your next boss is going to be a big Z Hunter fan. But basically, I do the same things I've been talking about. I figure out ways to turn wavy little tiny signals in the air into useful information for the rest of the world. So a lot of what I'm doing is doing things like hooking up microphones, using specialized equipment, and then on the computer side, doing digital signal processing, working in MATLAB, working in R, doing models of the world. It's all very scientific. I've been mostly doing research for a little while here, but I have enjoyed teaching a lot in the past. So, I mean, that's kind of where I'm at. I'm a signals guy, and I'm just obsessed with how we manage to make sense of the world based on these fiddly little waves in the air. So, there you go. Um, I hope that's interesting, and uh, yeah, Dr. Nick, yet somehow still not a brilliant man some days. Eh, go figure. There's no fixing some things, I guess. Good question. Moving on. So Nathan Simon asks, where do you see the channel going in the future? Honestly, I'm really happy with where the channel's at right now. I'm getting a huge, obscene amount of subscribers, which is bringing me joy. I I'm enjoying a lot of what I'm doing here, and it's a fun hobby. And honestly, I think that's what this is, and I think that's what it's going to stay. I can't sit here and pretend that this is going to make me a living. It's just it could never do that. If I was going to start trying to make a living, I'd have to start doing sponsored content or, you know, giving really nice reviews in exchange for more gear for next week. And the revenue on this doesn't even break even. It's not going to ever support me and my family. So this is just uh, this is just a hobby for me. But it's a hobby I'm enjoying. And the fact that I get to interact with the viewers, the fact that I get to play with all these loners, all of these things makes it a joy. And more of a joy than anything else is when I actually manage to help somebody. I got an email recently that just, oh, it made my heart swell in a non-medically problematic sort of way. A older guy saying, you know, I'm on a fixed income. I don't have a lot of money for gear, but I've been looking for a really good watch. He said, I saw your review of the Casio Duro, and you convinced me to try one, and I love it. He said, this may be the last watch I ever buy, but it's an incredible watch, and you did a solid by reviewing it. Like, oh, yes. Or the people who say, oh, Nick, I bought a, a Sleash Bowie or a Tie Lock or whatever at your insistence, and it's incredible. I love it. I love it so much. It's like, oh, you bring me joy. So if I can be bringing me joy with the channel and I can be bringing you joy, that's a great thing. And so right now, I'm enjoying it. And that's kind of where I'd like to see it go. Maybe someday I'll have to post a little bit less due to work. Maybe someday I'll have to post a little bit more because I'm bored. Who knows? But for the moment, I just kind of want to keep it where it's going because I'm enjoying it. And I hope you guys are too. Uh, there you go. Great question, Nathan. So Ashapa asks, have you ever considered making other YouTube genre videos? Things like vlogs, cooking videos, car repair, crazy cat videos. Um, you know, I haven't thought that much about it. Um, I'm liking where the channel's at, like I said. Uh, I don't have a cat, so I can't do crazy cat videos. I don't cook worth a damn, except stir-fry for some reason I can do. Um, uh, so cooking videos are pretty much out. Car repair is something I do a little bit of where I can, but by and large, when it gets more involved, I want to leave it to somebody who's actually trained, who's an, a craftsman, somebody who's got a real skill there that I just don't. And uh, in terms of vlogs, I'm never going to be the next PewDiePie. I don't think I'm that interesting, and honestly, it's not something that really tickles me, so to speak. Um, I have expanded the channel a little bit, though. Uh, the disassembly videos is something that I didn't actually think was going to be interesting to people, but have turned out really to be, and I enjoyed doing them as well. So that's one area of expansion. And if there's something else you'd love to see on the channel... And let me know. Put it down in the comments there. I may give it a try, or if I don't feel like it's going to be a great fit, that's fine too. But by and large, like I said, what I'm doing seems to be working. I don't want to train, you know, shift gears completely. Now it's going to be the Nick Shabazz Waterfowl Channel, where I just take pictures of ducks as I'm reading passages from Dostoevsky. I don't think a lot of people would stay subscribed for that, although, actually, Ducks and Dostoevsky would be a pretty decent other channel idea. Eh, keep an eye out. Anyway, so that's kind of where I'm at right now. If you got ideas, go ahead and put them in the comments. But by and large, I'm probably going to keep doing what I'm doing, because I'm enjoying what I'm doing. Although, maybe ducks. Maybe. Moving along. 
So Tyler Hammers asks, uh, Nick, can you do your best Gilbert Gottfried impression? Uh, well, <laughs> a lot of people think I sound like Gilbert Gottfried, and they're, honestly, they're onto something. If you listen to him in an interview when he's not shouting, there's some similarities there. Um, I feel a little awkward doing an impression of Gilbert because I have got a lot of respect for the man as a comedian, and he's kind of a king of impressions. And so I, I feel a little weird trying to pretend at the throne there. So what I'm going to do instead, given that I already sound a little like Gilbert Gottfried, is I'm just going to read some EDC-related jokes that kind of make sense to me and that he might enjoy if he was an EDC nut. And I'll try and do them vaguely in a Gottfriedian style. So, okay, why? The, uh, how many ZT executives does it take to screw in a light bulb? Zero. Because they all think it looks cooler when it's all black. Huh? Okay, that wasn't very good. Let's try again. So the CEO of Benchmade, the CEO of Spyderco, and the CEO of Gonzo, a Chinese cloning company, all walk into a bar. Spyderco CEO orders, Benchmade CEO orders, and the Gonzo CEO says, you know what? I think I'll have what they're having in like six months. No, that's a rim shot attempt. Okay, okay. What the Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, an honest politician, and Benchmade's quality control team all have in common? They're all pretty disappointed with the amount of hype around the recent Rolex Daytona release. Yeah, I thought I was going somewhere different with that. Oh, these aren't very good. Okay, okay, one last one. Uh, <laughs> why does Rick Hinderer never go camping with his family? Because he always forgets the tent. No? Uh, okay, I tried. Yeah, okay, so I shouldn't quit my day job. We've established that. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for the question, Tyler. And I'm so sorry, Gil, but you deserve a better tribute than that. Anyways, if you got further questions, like I said, drop them in the comments down below. I'm enjoying this series. I hope you are, except when I'm telling terrible jokes. And uh, have yourselves an absolutely wonderful day. And uh, bye, everybody, from uh, Dr. Nick. <laughs>